In this section, I'll be introducing students to the principles, basic principles of nutritional assessment, and also to the concepts of population health. This section complements chapter two in the textbook. So in this lecture, I'm going to be looking specifically at basic concepts of nutritional assessment and also on how to assess population health. So this will be a complement to what you're seeing in chapter two on key concepts and calculations and will set the foundation for more advanced concepts of assessment and eventually prescription later on in the course. In order to complete a nutritional assessment for an individual, and that is a complete nutritional assessment, you have to consider uh, these five points. First, the historical information uh, that's given to you, the anthropometric data that's collected from body composition measurements, the physical examination, notably looking for physical evidence of maybe malnutrition, of extreme emaciation, then the laboratory test that confirms uh, using blood markers uh, what the condition is and then finally the dietary assessment that confirms that nutritionally and dietarily that there's a problem with the way the person is eating. So referring to the historical information these are the four points that usually are quite relevant and pertinent uh, to the assessment. First the medical history, uh, the health history of the person, the socioeconomic status, the drug use, and of course the dietary practices and intakes of the individual. So what have they historically been doing? How have they historically eaten? Um, you know, what are their dietary practices and their diet practices? You'd want to know here if the person, for example, who is obese, for instance, uh, how often they've used um, a weight-reducing diets, to what ex extent they've restricted their diets, uh, the use of drugs, for example, in terms of uh, uh, prescription drugs and also in terms of non-prescription drugs. And, of course, the socioeconomic refers to their ability um, to use resources, financial resources, uh, in order to sustain a healthy life, a well-balanced well lifestyle. And of course the medical history is very important, right, in terms of understanding uh, what their condition has been historically, whether there's been a history of heart disease, a history of diabetes, uh, a history of gastrointestinal disease. I want to start by looking at dietary intakes and how to appropriately evaluate them. This is kind of a review from what you've seen previously, uh, notably in the obesity lectures. So to begin with, when you're doing a dietary assessment, you're really interested in determining first if it's a primary or a secondary deficiency. So a primary deficiency occurs when there's insufficient dietary intake of that specific nutrient. And we say, therefore, that the, um, that the poor nutrition or the deficiency is due to the lack of dietary nutrient specifically. Whereas a secondary deficiency is related to a disease process that inhibits the actual absorption of the nutrient, for instance, or that might heighten your requirement and therefore create an artificial temporary deficiency based on your medical condition. So then a primary deficiency is related to poor intake of a specific or a set of specific nutrients. Now iron deficiency anemia for instance in a primary deficiency is caused from poor dietary iron intake. In this slide, you get an idea of how to assess somebody's diet using computerized software. So for instance, what we have here in column one are the different nutrients and the calorie intake. We have the uh, actual caloric and nutrient intake in column two. We have the recommended intakes or the DRIs in column three the percent of the DRIs in column four, and whether or not it, the intake is deficient with a D, adequate with an A, or excessive with an E. 
Let's start with the calories. We see in this particular example that the analysis shows that the patient in question consumed 2,060 calories. And also we know, based on their activity factor, height and weight and age, that their DRI is 2,750 calories. This is what's recommended. So of course what we're doing here as a calculation is what percent of the DRI does their intake of calories represent? So the calculation is 20, 60 calories over 2,750 times 100. And we get that the patient's intake is 74.9%. So what do we understand from this calculation? Well, we do know from the textbook and from what we've seen previously in earlier chapters that when somebody's intake is less than 75% of required calories, um, that intake can be considered at high risk of being suboptimal. We also know that if the caloric intake is more than 25% over the recommended intake, that, that that particular intake of calories could be considered as excessive. So when we're looking here at 74.9, it certainly is less than 75%. So this person's a caloric intake specifically, is at high risk of being deficient, so we give them a D. When it comes to specific nutrients, we know that, uh, that there's a high risk of becoming deficient when the intake is 66% or less than the DRI. Uh, so let's take a look. Vitamin D. The intake is 3.4 micrograms. The requirement is 15 micrograms. And so their intake is 22.67% of the DRI, 3.4 divided by 15 times 100. So at 22.67% of the DRI, they are certainly under 66%. So that intake is D deficient. Now, vitamin, D, vitamin E is 11 milligrams per day. That's what they're taking in. The requirement is 15. So they're consuming 73.33% of the DRI. That's 11 divided by 15 times 100. So 73% is not under 66%. So we can say that their intake is adequate. Thiamine, 3.4 milligrams is the intake. The requirement is 1.2. That's 283.33% of the DRI. We might tend to believe that because it's over 100% that it's got to be excessive. But again, uh, for a nutrient to be excessive, it's got to be over the UL, and there has to be a UL. So if you check the UL at the end of chapter 3, you can see there's a UL table. You will not find a UL for thymine. This means that it's impossible to say whether or not uh, an intake of thiamine is excessive. So consequently, even though the percent is elevated, there is no UL for thiamine specifically, so the intake is categorized as adequate. Let's look at vitamin C, 1,300 milligrams intake. The um, DRI is 50 milligrams, so that's 1,444%. And so that looks to be quite excessive, but again, the only way to know if this micronutrient is excessive is not by the percent, but by consulting the UL table at the end of chapter 3. And if you do consult it, you'll see the UL is at 2,000 milligrams. So 1,300 milligrams, even though it's a large percent over the DRI, it's still under the 2,000 milligram cutoff, so vitamin C is considered as adequate. Now, what is a secondary deficiency? It's a nutrient deficiency caused by something other than poor dietary intake. Iron deficiency anemia, for example, could be caused in this case by a bleeding ulcer, for instance. Or it could also be due to a poor um, absorption of the nutrient because of some other factor like an inflammatory bowel disease. Now, if a patient is malnourished, uh, we can talk about it in terms of undernutrition or even overnutrition. So in both circumstances, the term malnutrition could still equally be applied. So in other words, an obese patient that looks as though they're overfed can indeed be 
uh, suffering from overnutrition. A person who is underweight and emaciated um, can be regarded, of course, as undernourished. Now, for a bit of clarity, what do I mean by anthropometric measures? Well, there, these are measurements pertaining to the body, the weight, the height, and the skin folds. So anthropometric measurements taken repeatedly over a period of time provide a trend overall. Nutritional status, uh, for example, can be measured by that trend. But little information regarding specific nutrients can come from this specific type of measurement. So when we talk about skin folds, we're really talking about measurements of subcutaneous fat f that allow for an indirect estimation of total body fat. So we have three examples here. The one on the left is the bicep. The one in the middle of is the superiliac. And the one on the far right is the subscapular. And in all three of these cases, we can see that we're looking at a fat pinch that's taking place. And this allows the physician or the nutritionist or dietitian to make an overall estimation of the total fat content of the body using specific equations that are um, permitting this kind of a calculation. Now, in this particular clinical case, we have a patient with cancer cachexia, extreme emaciation. Now, we can see that there are three physical manifestation of this cachexia, of this extreme emaciation. We have the deltoid um, muscles, for example, that are basically depleted, so it forms kind of a square shoulder. We have the subscapular, where we can see the uh, protrusion of the, of the scapula and basically no fat around that area. We see the superiliac right below over here, just above the hip area, and we can see that there's no fat there as well. So the eroded deltoid, superiliac, bicep, subscapular, and tricep muscles are quite evident in this cachexia patient. So subcutaneous fat is also missing in other areas. These are all overt clinical signs of malnutrition. These clinical signs were determined in this case by anthropometry or measures of body composition. In the process of assessing, we're interested in clinical signs. These are visible physical medical signs that objectively confirm a disease, a toxicity, or a specific kind of deficiency. In the case of overnutrition, the clinical signs are also, again, visible through the means of anthropometric measurements. And these measure excessive visceral fat, for instance, high percent of body fat overall, and of course, a high waist circumference. So now you understand the highlights of how to do the nutritional assessment of an individual. But there's also an approach to do the nutritional assessment of a population. In doing so, you're able to determine the health of a nation. This is a question that a government would be interested in answering. Doing the assessment of a population's nutritional health can begin with measuring national disappearance of food. So by surveying the food supply and the population, we can find out what foods are available to the population for consumption. This information can be used to identify possible dietary deficiencies and excesses in the population based on the availability. So looking at the graph right here, for instance, looking at the gallons per person consumed uh, going from 1909 all the way to the late 90s, we can see that total milk consumption uh, is taking a decline probably uh, right around the 1940s and we can see a gradual progression but we see specifically whole milk descending quite significantly uh, and we see it especially t uh, going down by the 70s and the uh, late 60s and this related to a little bit of the fat free uh, endorsement of food products. So whole milk was perceived as, as a little too high in fat. And we can see the lower fat consumption uh, picking up right around that time period where the whole milk is declining. So we understand a little bit what's going on, but we also understand to the same degree uh, that the uh, lower fat milk is not necessarily uh, compensating uh, for the loss of whole milk. 
And so from this particular uh, graph, which is drawn up uh, specifically in terms of disappearance of food, so this is rather than looking at specific dietary intakes, we're looking at how much food is disappearing from the inventory. And in this particular example, we're looking at how whole food is disappearing from the national inventory and how low fat milk is coming up a little bit in the inventory as well. Now also national nutrition surveys um, are very important as well as food inventory or disappearance of food inventory in understanding population health. Now for instance the US Congress uses the information gathered from surveys to establish public policy on nutrition education or establishing regulations on national food supply. Scientific communities use the information to establish research priorities, for instance, and the food industry uses the information for product development and public relations and marketing. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uses the information for the development and monitoring of the national health goals. And government also writes reports that examines the relationship between diet and health uh, using information from these particular national health surveys. These particular surveys are really cross-sectional looks at the population at one period of time uh, and during that time a specific allocated randomized uh, selected population will answer a set of questions regarding lifestyle regarding uh, dietary habits and so forth and from this information all of these particular agencies and groups can use the information as I previously noted. The most popular and the most utilized of the national health surveys is called NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And the NHANES is done over various uh, time periods. And you can see if you even search uh, NHANES in Google, you can see there are different time demarcations, different years that establish certain, um, uh, you know, certain facts about the way the Americans are eating. And with these, um, these different cross-sectional uh, surveys were able to see either a progression improvement in dietary habits or a decline in dietary habits or in obesity prevalence and so forth. So these uh, surveys, notably the NHANES in particular, but there are others, uh, provide enough information for national health goals to be established. So they are indeed developed from these national nutrition surveys. Each decade, for instance, Healthy People Program is, um, is basically established for the population that it identifies the nation's health priorities and guides policies that promote health and prevent disease in the population. And, and all this information gathered from the NHANES and other surveys of that nature um, sort of provide the relevant information for the formulation of the Healthy People Report. Consequently, uh, you'll see Healthy People 2010, Healthy People 2020, and the next one that we're now looking at is Healthy People 2030. Now, the Healthy People 20, 20, 2010 goals that were established back then, um, as, as are the 2030 goals, are administered by the U.S. Public Health Service, which comes under the Department of Health and Human Services. And the, goal, the goals back in 2010 were this. Goal one, increase the quality in years of a healthy life. And goal two was um, eliminating health disparities in the population. In order to achieve these goals, um, it was important to monitor key health indicators. And there were four top health indicator risks uh, that the government was monitoring. Physical inactivity, poor nutrition tied to overweight and obesity, tobacco use, and youth risking um, behaviors such as substance abuse. 
So the Healthy People 2010 report tells us that between 2000 and 2010, the government had prioritized the monitoring of these four key issues in order to bring about or ensure uh, public health. Uh, and notice here how the top two were physical inactivity and overweight and obesity. And these had become particularly important because it was clear for the um, epidemiologists that were monitoring the health of the nation that these two factors, well, in fact, these three factors, the sedentary lifestyle of Americans and the weight problem were going to actually significantly impact our healthcare system. The Healthy People 2020 had many different objectives, but basically this is a good summary uh, that uh, brings to the forefront what they were trying to achieve. First, attaining high quality, longer lives, free of preventable disease, disability, injury, and premature death. Two, achieve health equity, eliminate disparities, and improve the health of all groups create social and physical environments that promote good health for all and promote health and reduce chronic disease risks through the consumption of healthy diets and the achievement and maintenance of healthy body weights. I want to point out that the fourth point in the Healthy People Report comes under nutrition and healthy weight status. Notice how obesity and overweight is left out of the language uh, in order that people not be offended. The report nevertheless points out that it's still interested in controlling weight. Notice how it talks about uh, improving the physical environments that promote good health. And this really relies on this idea that in the urban centers that we can develop facilities, parks, uh, and different other um, aspects, I think, of the community that would facilitate a physical activity, a more uh, healthy physical activity, and constant physical activity. So it recognizes the importance of this physical environment, uh, so taking away the focus strictly from diet. Notice at the top, uh, the, the objective was to attain high quality, longer lives free of preventable diseases. And that really means free of chronic disease. So point one and point four kind of overlap each other. And it's a subtle way to talk about the, um, the, the really the objective of reducing the prominence of obesity and overweight in the population because associated with these conditions are indeed chronic disease, preventable disease that actually lead to premature death. So in the 2020 uh, Healthy People Report, it's very clear that the government understands that obesity and overweight are problems that are really multifactorial in terms of their origins and understanding the role of the social as well as the physical environment, understanding the importance of diet uh, in the role of chronic disease, uh, of preventable disease uh, in ensuring healthy uh, population and ensuring a long life as a healthy individual and that there is an importance here uh, of um, maintaining healthy body weights because he's under the government understands that a lot of dieting can lead to weight loss but the whole idea is sustaining that weight loss over a long term by living in an environment that facilitates that whether it whether we're talking about the availability of healthy good grocery stores, for example, as opposed to corner stores that have unhealthy foods. And so this is equitable uh, management of the environment. So all levels of the population uh, are really helped and aided by the environment, uh, an environment that's promoting really good health. So for instance, I want to take a look in the 2020 report, how the government purports to achieve uh, a high quality, longer life for the individual and the population. Well, this is what they're proposing. Nutrition and weight status, physical activity, 
chronic kidney disease and di diabetes is their focus here, reducing that. Environmental health and tobacco use, making sure that tobacco use is on the decline. Um, the management of arthritis, osteoporosis, chronic back conditions, heart disease and stroke, and then early and middle childhood and adolescent health as well. And so this is you know, um, a subsection of that particular goal, and this is how they want to achieve it. So you can see at um, how nutrition and weight status uh, becomes a subset of achieving high quality, longer lives. But the other thing that is less apparent here is that chronic kidney disease and diabetes are very much tied together it is true, but that type 2 diabetes is intimately tied with weight status. 90 to 95 percent of type 2 diabetics are actually overweight or obese. Then we have osteo, um, osteoporosis, arthritis, chronic back, back pain conditions, and heart disease and stroke, all tied to some degree to obesity. And then we're looking at early, middle childhood and adolescent health, a complicated area because here we're looking at um, the abuse on drugs, but we're also looking at a growing prevalence of obesity in this group. So this early childhood and middle childhood adolescent health uh, is really about primarily focusing on weight by introducing exercise, healthy eating, healthy behaviors, and so forth. Now I want to take a look at the new Healthy People 2030 report that actually just came out and it suggests that between 2020 and 2030 uh, the following healthy goals uh, need to be achieved or recommended to be achieved in the United States. So let's take a look at the different goals. First, attain healthy purposeful lives and well-being. Two, attain health literacy, achieve health equity, eliminate disparities, and improve the health and well-being of all populations. And then three, create social and physical environments that promote attaining full potential for health and well-being for all. Uh, number four, uh, promote healthy development, healthy behaviors, and well-being across all life stages. And then engage with uh, stakeholders and key constituents across multiple factors, sectors, that is to say, to take action and design policy that improves health and well-being for all populations. So when we take a step back from these goals, we see that obesity and overweight uh, is no longer or are no longer taking top priority in terms of these goals, but rather they're integrated uh, very subtly within uh, specific uh, within specific goals that are non-specific, <laughs> if we could actually put a little humor to it. So we see um, a healthy development, healthy behaviors, uh, certainly encompassing good nutrition and weight status, and this is how we find it categorized in the you know, as a subset to these particular goals, uh, basically nutrition and healthy weights. Um, but we don't really see it prominently featured. We also see uh, the sense of well-being and sense of well-being sort of suggests a non-denominational spirituality. This idea that if you are well with yourself, there's a psychological and spiritual dimension that are that is being promoted here and that the government wants its population to achieve because of course it's tied to productivity, but it's tied to a purposeful life and being healthy. And of course we know that this healthfulness uh, really translates into greater productivity and this is good for the nation and it's good for the people. So what we see in the management of obesity is that diets essentially don't really work. This is what is coming out of the literature since 2007 and does this have any significance uh, with respect to these healthy people goals? Well, uh, Richard Carmona, Surgeon General of the United States in 2001 said to physicians that Individual counseling cannot possibly work in the management of obesity since obesity is a socio-demographic problem. This means that the socio-demographic difficulties uh, and ambiguities uh, need to be resolved before any success in weight loss nationwide can be achieved. 
So how about a little question? What government agency is directly responsible for the development of the Healthy People Program in the United States? Pause here and select the correct answer. So now the agency responsible for directly putting out Healthy People Programs is the Department of Health and Human Services, E. Here's the second question. Identify the name of the U.S. government program that uses the information obtained from the National Nutrition Health Survey to establish national health goals for the nation. Pause here and select your answer. Well, the correct answer is C, Healthy People Program. A deficiency caused by an inadequate dietary intake is Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is C. It's a primary deficiency. 